OK, but you have to start the clock. You can master the technology. Otherwise, I'll go on forever. OK, so I'm going to continue now talking about the evolution of sex and recombination, which is what I was supposed to talk about originally, I think. Um, and the, the lecture actually does exist as a kind of PowerPoint thing, which will appear, honest. Um, but I'll try doing it just on the board, uh, because there aren't any exciting pictures of organisms. So if you feel bored, you can just imagine some exciting organism. So just to recap uh, what I talked about, I guess, on Tuesday. I'm losing track of time here. Um, sexual reproduction is widespread in all organisms. But in bacteria and viruses, it may well be simply a side effect of other things side effect of infection by bacteriophage, of transmission of plasmids, of uptake of DNA as kind of food from the environment, etc., etc. Um, but the real problem is to explain the extraordinary, um, extraordinary meiotic sexual cycle, which is essentially universal amongst eukaryotes. So at some stage in their life history, almost all eukaryote species go through meiosis. And they almost all have some kind of alternation of haploid and diploid phases. Haploid gametes coming together in what we call syngamy, and then coming apart in meiosis, producing recombinant offspring. So, so how do we explain this? Well, the, the origin of this eukaryotic meiotic sex is really very obscure. And I speculated a little bit, saying that we can see a clear advantage to syngamy, to bringing together different haploid genomes, because then recessive deleterious mutations will be masked. And we observe an extremely large uh, increase in fitness, termed heterosis, when we bring together different genomes and we mask deleterious recessives. So there's an immediate advantage to bringing together haploid genomes. But it's less clear how meiosis arose. Um, it may be that the diploid phase brought about by syngamy allows direct repair of damage to the DNA. For example, double-stranded breaks can only be repaired if you have another copy to transfer information across. And they may also allow a kind of indirect repair um, through uh, the ability of recombination to reconstruct fit <coughs> genomes from two less fit genomes. And I'm going to talk about that rather more uh, tomorrow in the last lecture. So I'm going to try and avoid talking about the origins of sex and recombination, the origins of meiosis, etc., and concentrate on how it is that sexual reproduction and recombination are maintained at high levels in most eukaryotes in the present day. And uh, I talked about the, the very strong and obvious costs of sex and recombination, costs due to finding a mate, due to go, going through meiosis. Most uh, Clearly, the twofold cost of sex, if you have anisogamy, if the females devote, produce most of the resources devoted to rearing the young, then why don't females just produce females? Why do they bother uh, helping the males propagate their genomes? Okay. And in the limit where the males provide nothing to the next generation, then there's a twofold advantage to a female who simply reproduces asexually and produces identical daughters. So. We have a variety of costs, most obviously this twofold cost of sex, and they have to be counterbalanced by some really quite strong advantage. And that has to be a short-term advantage, and it has to be an advantage that we can explain through the mechanism of natural selection amongst individuals. We can see that this short-term advantage is necessary in various ways. One is to look at life cycles where there's uh, facultative parthenogenesis or cyclical parthenogenesis, where it seems rather easy for organisms that go through both sexual and asexual reproduction to alter the ratios of those two. What determines the ratio that they actually have? What determines, what maintains the substantial fraction of their life cycle that is sexual? And similarly, if we look at most eukaryotes, uh, we see that there's a fairly high recombination rate with order one crossover per chromosome. Some of that is simply a mechanical constraint that actually to segregate the chromosomes, you typically do need a crossover. But that's not essential because the crossover can be moved to the end of the chromosome, in which case it has no genetic consequence. 
doesn't actually produce any recombinant offspring if the crossover is simply, if you like, tethering the ends of the chromosomes allowing them to segregate. And also, there are examples such as famous, you know, the male Drosophila, which actually have no crossover at all. They've managed to do meiosis in a peculiar way, which doesn't involve crossing over. So, clearly, recombination and sex aren't essential. They can vary in their frequency. What maintains them at the current level? Okay. So, this is something which is really a tractable question, both theoretically and experimentally. Um, but it's a difficult question. So people have been thinking really hard about this since the sort of mid-1970s. And I think I'd like to say that the theory is much clearer now than it was. You may or may not agree after the lecture. Um, but empirically, I think we're still quite a long way from really having a good quantitative understanding of what's going on. Okay. So what I'm going to be doing is really laying out the population genetic explanations, focusing on what I actually know about, which is the theoretical uh, reasons why recombination and sexual reproduction may be favored as a result of their effects on the composition of the population. That's what I mean by population genetic explanation. So So this is a rather obvious point, but it's a really fundamental point, that if we're going to explain the effects of the, the maintenance of sex and recombination in population genetic terms, then sex and recombination have to actually do something to the population. And that requires that the population be non, have, contain non-random association. Um, and this includes, actually, both linkage disequilibrium and also deviations from Hardy-Weinberg proportion. So if you imagine a population you know, where there's just a single locus segregating, but let's say diploids are the, are the predominant part of the life cycle. If that population is in Heide-Weinberg proportion, then random mating will not alter those proportions. Okay? And so whether or not you go through sexual reproduction doesn't make any difference. So I may as well just put up a little picture showing that. This is just going over basics that I think Bruce introduced at the beginning. Suppose we have big A, big A, big A, little a, little a, little a, and we have them in these proportions, actually. And these are the proportions in the males. These are the proportions in the females. And let's suppose that they come together at random, then the proportion of meetings between big A, big A, and big A, big A is going to be the area of this little box. And similarly, for these other possibilities, so we have nine kinds of mating. And with random mating, the areas of these boxes give you the proportions. And then we want to know what the next generation is going to be. Well, these produce entirely AA. These produce half Big A, big A, sorry, where are we? Big A, big A, and uh, big A, little A. Did I get that right? Yeah. And these produce entirely heterozygotes, okay? And we go on like this, we find that a cross between two heterozygotes here produces equal proportions of these, and these, and then heterozygotes produced either one gene from the mother, one from the father, or the other way around, et cetera, et cetera, one to two to one. So this is just a kind of geometrical uh, demonstration that the proportions of heterozygotes, homozygotes, and the other homozygotes here are given by the product of the frequency of this allele, this plus a half this, this is the frequency of the allele in the males times the frequency of the allele in the females, which is usually the same, etc. So this is a geometric demonstration of Hardy-Weinberg. 
So the point I'm making here is that if these proportions here are different between the sexes, are different from the standard p squared of 2pq to q squared, then there will be a change in the proportions from one generation to the next. And even with random mating, and actually you go immediately to the standard Hardy-Weinberg. But if the population is already in Hardy-Weinberg, there's no change, nothing happens. And so whether you reproduce asexually and just forget all this bother and just go directly to the next generation, or you go through all this palaver, doesn't make any difference to the composition of the population. And I could do a similar kind of diagram, but I won't bother with that, it's fairly obvious. If you had a situation where you had big A, big B, in a haploid population, etc. If those proportions are in linkage equilibrium, in other words, if the probability of having big A or little a at one locus is independent of having big B or little b at the second locus, if everything's already well shuffled, then going through a round of sex and recombination makes no difference. So it's crucial that we have some kind of non-random association uh, in the population, and I'll focus on linkage disequilibrium, because I think that's the major problem and the effect of recombination on that. We have to have some kinds of non-random association in order for population genetics to have any effect, to be able to explain agents of recombination. So in a way, it's, it's a, one of these actually rather typical situations in evolutionary biology where we've known the answer for a long time, but haven't really been very clear about it, exactly how to justify it. And so you go back to about 1900, late 19th, early 20th century, to August Weissman, who was one of the few people around then who uh, was really a champion of natural selection. And he said, uh, I wouldn't say altogether clearly, but I'll just quote his words, the communication of uh, fresh material to the germplasm implies an augmentation of the variational tendencies and therefore an increase in the power of adaptation. And he wrote various other um, sort of paragraphs like this, pointing out that sexual reproduction has the effect of generating variation and that variation is necessary for natural selection to be effective. Um, so his view actually was a very lonely view at the time. Uh, this was a period that's been called the eclipse of natural selection where it was thought that what mattered were the genetic mechanisms, what mattered were the kinds of mutations produced, the kind of mutations studied by the classical geneticists. It took a long time for natural selection to be, as we would say now, properly appreciated. Um, in fact, extraordinarily, I remember finding a history of biology in the University of Edinburgh Library, and the edition I found, it was by the author, um, but the edition was published in the 1950s, mid-1950s, and it said at the end, I looked up natural selection in the index, and it said, um, this now discredited mechanism, basically. You know, it had about a page on natural selection, <laughs> you know, and it, and it really was extraordinary that in sort of mainstream biology, until the mid-20th century, you know, natural selection was not seen as particularly important. The people that we now revere as the founders of, you know, what we call the evolutionary synthesis, Fisher, Wright, Haldane, Dobzhansky, and so on, were not so prominent until really the 1940s, 1950s, I guess. And, you know, it, it took a long time for natural selection to emerge as the primary force driving adaptation. Very strange kind of history. So, so Weissman pointed out that, you know, basically sex recombination are a good thing because they generate variation. We need variation in order to adapt by natural selection. Um, but this, this view, first of all, you know, natural selection itself wasn't appreciated for a long time. But then even in the evolutionary synthesis amongst people like um, Dobzhansky, E.B. Ford and so on, in the general writings in evolutionary biology in the sort of 1940s, 1950s, even in the 1960s, there was this general acceptance that sex was a good thing, as Weissman said, because it was kind of good for the species. There wasn't very much critical thought about how exactly it was maintained. And once people started to really think about it rather more clearly in terms of selection on individuals, then the problem of translating Weissman's intuition into a, a really clear quantitative theory those emerged, and we've been sort of worrying away at this for the last 60 years or so. So I suppose it tells you that science is, is quite a slow business, and it takes a long time to sort out confusions. Uh, so anyway, I hope we do better in the future, but probably not. Yeah, yeah, so.
Okay, um, so I talked last time about you know the, the clear evidence for the long-term advantage of sex. I mean, it was it was it was perfectly reasonable to to believe that sex was essential for the survival of species in the long term. That's not disputed. I talked about um, the, the tendency over a long time scale of a few hundred thousand or million years or so of asexual species to go extinct. They arise, but they eventually go extinct. Um, the gradual degeneration over similar time scales, million year time scales of sex chromosomes. If a chromosome uh, acquires a sex determining locus or becomes associated with a sex determining locus, there are processes that suppress recombination. And once recombination is suppressed, for reasons we'll see, uh, the, uh, the chromosome tends to degenerate. Um, and so these sorts of examples show that you know, sex is indeed essential in the long run. I suppose you could also look at practices in plant and animal breeding, where it might be more convenient for breeders to work with inbred homogeneous lines because there'd be no annoying variation in you know, when to make the harvest, etc., etc. But that, of course, doesn't work. We, the standard practice is indeed to maintain large sexual outcrossing populations and indeed to make crosses between different populations to augment variation. All of this requiring sexual reproduction. And you can even take bizarre examples from, well, to me, bizarre, because I'm not a computer scientist, but bizarre examples from evolutionary computation, which I mentioned before, where people try and um, just sort of generate uh, superior algorithms or superior designs by selection, by a kind of artificial selection. And there's a really neat example by a son called John Coza, who's quite prominent in this area, quite a while ago. And... He had the great idea of evolving electronic gadgets, right? So what he did, I mean, I think he didn't actually build these, but he sort of you know, simulated how they would work if he did build them. But he just said, let's suppose we have circuits. This one's not going to work, but there we go. Basically, what we can do is, is wire together components, which involve uh, capacitors and resistors and inductors. And we have an input, and we have an output, and then we have any kind of stuff in between. And we, we select for something that will, let's say, filter out low frequencies and let high frequencies through. So we have some kind of filter, and we throw together some, some conglomeration of these things, and it will do something. Let's say we find one that has, let's say, this is, you know, the, I'm not sure, the transmission as a function of frequency. And what we want is a sharp filter that will filter at a certain threshold frequency. And so you just basically make random changes in the strengths of these components. You remove components, you insert components, you recombine circuits. You do all the things you would do genetically if you could read uh, circuits. It's a bit of an alarming thought, thinking of, of uh, computers and so on starting to mate with each other and so on. It wouldn't be a good idea. But in this case, he actually set the thing up so that it did work remarkably well. After you know, some tens of generations, you've got a rather sharp uh, filter, okay? So you could indeed improve these things. What was interesting about this, and I think rather charming in a way, is that various designs emerged that had actually been patented some years before. So people had thought these are clever ideas, they were worth patenting. And you know, you just throw stuff together at random and mutate and recombine and so on. And you, you know, you get things that work pretty well. And, and actually, people use this a lot because actually selection is much less effort and often as effective as human designers. And if you've got the whole process of design, it actually contains a large element of selection. Some people work, some people don't. So there's this whole field. And actually, this field splits into different camps. But it seems to be generally accepted that recombination is necessary. There are some kind of subcultures and tribes in this field that try and do everything with just mutation. But generally, it works better, it seems, just empirically, just from what people say at conferences. And they even have competitions you know, amongst different uh, programming schemes and such like. They, they find that recombination generally does work. So you know, we have all this sort of evidence that at the level of the species, at the level of the whole electronic circuit, you could say, um, sex recombination really do facilitate adaptation. But the difficulty is to really understand in quantitative terms how that translates into selection that will maintain sex, will maintain the combination. Okay. So where do we start? Well, anyone want to guess where I'm going to start? Who am I going to start with? Darwin? 
yeah, I could start with Darwin, but okay, not Darwin. Second, if I'm not starting with Darwin, who do I start with? Fisher, Fisher, exactly. So, sorry? Uh, I'm going to get tired. I'll be explicit here. If I'm using up a lot of blackboard. Okay, so Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection. It's interesting that really only Fisher called it the fundamental theorem. And so it tends to be called the fundamental theorem in quotation marks. You're outside Fisher. I mean, Fisher was, was really excited about this. And in his 1930 book, he had a rather <laughs> poetical page where he likened it to the second law of thermodynamics and, and thought this was the, really the supreme law of biology. Um, and actually, there's been an awful lot of arguments since then about whether it's correct and what it means. I mean, the way I would phrase it is to say that the increase of mean fitness of a population due to natural selection on allele frequencies is precisely equal to the additive variance in fitness. And you can derive that very easily. I think there's someone in the audience who's working on the fundamental. Who's working on the fundamental? Good. Do you agree with that statement? Sort of, I know. So <laughs> I suspect it's hard to find two people who have exactly the same definition of what the fundamental theorem is. So, um, so it's a mathematical you know, tautology, in a sense. If you define fitnesses of individuals, you ask how the average fitness of a population will increase from one generation to the next, simply as a result of selection. And assuming that you're only following the changes in allele frequency rather than the changes in combinations of alleles, then you get precisely uh, a quantity, an increase in mean fitness, which is equal to the additive variance in fitness. So if you define everything in the right way, it's precisely correct. And I think this is the correct interpretation. There was a long argument between those who thought that Fisher was trying to make a predictive formula, a kind of physical law that would predict the way mean fitness would change. And in that case, it doesn't work because all sorts of things are going on and the total change is not equal to the additive variance in fitness. I think what Fisher was instead doing was identifying one component of the change in mean fitness and uh, identifying it with this crucial fundamental quantity, the additive variance in fitness. And the point is that although natural selection is changing allele frequencies in such a way as to increase mean fitness, and we saw that actually with the selection gradient formulation as well, if selection is acting solely on allele frequencies, indeed mean fitness would increase. But to the extent that selection is acting on gene combinations, and those gene combinations are then broken up by recombination, that will tend to reduce mean fitness. Okay. Recombination acts randomly with respect to fitness, and more often than not, it will tend to break up Good combinations reduce mean fitness. Similarly, mutation will reduce mean fitness. Changes of environment will change the fitnesses of individuals. And again, because it's acting randomly with respect to the adaptation of the organism, or even acting counter to the adaptation of one species, if we're talking about the biotic environment of competing species or of parasites and so on. There are all these other processes which tend to decrease mean fitness. And natural selection acting on allele frequencies, in a sense, is the only process systematically increasing mean fitness. And Fisher really actually discusses this very nicely, and I recommend, although very few people recommend reading his book, I think I do recommend reading his book, because he has a nice discussion of this counterbalance between the adaptive force of natural selection encapsulated by his fundamental theorem and the other processes which are tending to degrade fitness. And actually, it's immediately clear if you just you know think about what fit, sorry, Oh, Fisher, 1913, The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection. So when I say the book, I mean either The Origin of Species, or I mean The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection, or I mean my evolution textbook. So, <laughs> yes. or, or Bruce's textbook as well, yes. Or John's textbook. All right, or John's textbook. Now, you all start arguing about who, who's 
Uh, so if we did it by mass, it will be your book, I think, that wins out. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, where was I? The fundamental theorem. Okay. So we identify, if you like, the, the rate of adaptation as depending, crucially, on the additive genetic variance. Okay. And so we can then think, how does recombination affect the process? And the basic quantification of Weissman's argument is to say that if recombination tends to increase the additive variance in fitness, then it will allow a greater rate of adaptation by natural selection in the future. So when you say recombination effects are good because they generate variation, it's not just any old variation. Specifically, they have to increase the additive variance in fitness. And so the argument is really that if we imagine fitness as depending on all kinds of stuff, there are alleles knocking about that increase fitness, that decrease fitness, and so on. If they were combined at random, okay, then the variance would not be affected by recombination in sex, by shuffling. If they're already well shuffled, further rounds of random shuffling cannot have any effect on the variance. So we require negative associations, or more precisely, negative LD amongst favorable alleles. Is Indian spelling British or American? Favorable with a U or not? Does it? You don't mind? Okay. And I, I was hoping it would still be British. But anyway. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the point is that if we have predominantly negative associations, so that we have combinations like this in excess, then clearly the variation will be decreased. And if we then shuffle those combinations, we generate plus, 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 minus, 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 we increase the variance. Okay? And as I've drawn it, we don't alter the mean value, uh, but we do inflate the variance, and therefore the rate of adaptation in the next generation will be increased. This is still not an individual level explanation, and actually it's non-trivial seeing how exactly this, this aids a modifier allele that is altering the rate of the combination or altering the rate of sex. But you can show that if recombination and sex generate favorable combinations, which will be picked up by selection, then the modifier alleles themselves that generated those will tend to be associated with it. And so you have, crucial to the whole process, this kind of hitchhiking, or sometimes called indirect selection, in which the existence of a modifier allele that increases the rate of sex, increases the rate of recombination, generates favorable combinations, it also generates unfavorable ones, but the favorable ones are picked up by selection, they increase, and given the right linkage relations, that will tend to also increase the frequency of the modifier, even though the modifier has no direct effect on it. So that's a sort of hand-waving explanation of the sort of general uh, way in which we go from Weissman's verbal statement that recombination is a good thing because it facilitates adaptation, to thinking quantitatively about how this is driven, and it's What's going to be crucial is the effect of recombination in sex on the additive variance in fitness. Okay. Yep. So one of the things that can possibly be the abstract shuffling for its back to So the the best cutting way to do this, especially with more metrics like the budget and more distance that makes the time. Their big thing now is to try to find the most interesting combination of in reliance on the unvariant effect. They think that's the biggest way to do it. So how do they do that? Well, think, think about things like putting in some of the recombination genes in the genome. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I'll come to some evidence which, which is along the same lines, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So if there's money in it, then that's another source of support for the theory. Okay. Okay, so, so this, this point, although you know, it seems really obvious that, you know, firstly, that if you're going to explain sex and recombination in population genetic terms, there has to be LD, and you have to have systematic negative associations in order for uh, 
recombination to facilitate adaptation. Those points are actually were, I think, first made really clearly by Judith Felsenstein. I'm probably going to have to refer to Bruce for the date because I always get these. He wrote so many papers. No, I've got 81 here. I've got 1981, quite late. You know. So he just produced a classification of theories based on this idea. And in fact, there was a very nice book by Maynard Smith called Evolution of Sex. 1978, I think. Um, very nicely written book. Actually, I recommend it because it's all often good to go back to the early books. I'm not saying this about Fisher's book, uh, but about <laughs> books in general. The earlier books are often simpler because they haven't accumulated weights of complication. And Maynard Smith's very clear account. However, it wasn't very, if you like, coherent in the sense that there were many different models which exemplified different scenarios in which uh, sex could be favored. There were things like the Elm Beetle model and uh, you know the various models named after some sort of toy example of you know, beetles living in an elm tree or something like this. Um, and what Felsenstein did was bring some sort of order to these different models and show that actually you could classify them and that particular sets of models were driven by the same theoretical structure. So it's really simplified things. So what he did was classify things in two axes, I think. So we have here deterministic explanations and, if you like, stochastic explanations. And basically this comes down to explanations that depend primarily on selection building up negative associations versus random genetic drift building up negative associations. So he's identified the negative associations as the key feature. And you can say, are they generated by some kind of random process or generated by some deterministic process? And I'm going to start focusing on the deterministic processes, specifically selection. And then, you can be thinking of models which involve deleterious mutations where the selective pressure is to eliminate deleterious mutations as efficiently as possible. And this is actually an attractive kind of scenario because it's kind of universal. Every organism suffers de mutation. Mutations are primarily deleterious because organisms are pretty well adapted. Um, so this is a universal process. And we're trying to explain the universal feature. So this is an attractive process. But at the other extreme, we can have beneficial mutations, or I should say generally um, adaptation. Trying to adapt to a new environment, trying to establish an allele that uh, introduces insecticide resistance or whatever. Something involving the increase of favorable alleles rather than the elimination of unfavorable. In fact, these are often very similar. The difference is that these deleterious alleles tend to be at low frequency and are being eliminated to zero. Whereas here we have alleles that are beneficial starting at low frequency and sweeping to high frequency. And then in between, you have various models that involve fluctuating, oh, I suppose I should write it down. Fluctuating selection, one sort or another. And so we might have, uh, in this category, we could have various sort of host parasite coevolutionary models involving large populations in which there's some kind of arms race between a host and its pathogen, in which both are under fluctuating selection pressures. Um, most of these models, and these models were actually championed most prominently by Bill Hamilton, okay, who emphasized on kind of you know, natural history grounds the importance of disease in evolution, uh, something that's been emphasized also by J.B.S. Holding. Um, but they're mostly simulation models, so it's quite hard to work out what's going on. I'm not going to say very much about these because they're kind of complicated. Um, but to argue generally that in these simulations, actually there may be elements of a number of different theoretical explanations from these different boxes. And I'll focus on some of these boxes. So I'm going to start by thinking about the deterministic problem, which is a little bit simpler. And 
just to say that this actually uh, applies to all kinds of selection. And one can come up with a, a rather general framework which accounts for the individual advantage of modifiers of recombination, um, which covers actually all of these kinds of selection. So what I'm going to do is start, I'm, I'm afraid, with a rather you know, abstract result that shows how the selection for recombination is related to the effects of recombination on the distribution of fitness, the mean and the variance of fitness. And then I'll give a specific example in which negative associations are built up by a certain kind of gene interaction, a certain kind of epistasis, and operates through the more efficient elimination of deleterious mutations in the presence of a combination. So before lunch, I sort of set out this sort of very general kind of machinery in which we could set up a series of you know, selection coefficients which define fitness as a function of genotype. And we could write down equations for the change in associations between sets of genes due to selection and the breakdown of those associations by recombination. Okay. And you'll be relieved to hear that I'm not going to go into that in any more detail by selection. Of course, if you have a constant epistasis, then the combination is disfavored. That's a standard production. So this isn't obvious, though, from the theories. And what I was complaining about with all of these sort of Hamilton-type simulations is that there's lots of stuff going on in there, some of which is this kind of fluctuating epistasis argument, which kind of works only in very restrictive circumstances. But a lot of what's going on is simply directional selection. You're trying to adapt to a new challenge, new pathogen, or whatever. And that's working through this kind of general framework. And the problem with a lot of the, well, I'm now complaining and partly self-motivated because I do theory rather than simulation. But a lot of the problem with simulation results in this field is that, yes, you can increase sex, you can increase recombination, but you don't actually know why any more than you know why it's maintained in nature. So there's a lot of work, actually, to go into a simulation and really sort out what processes are favoring recombination. Right. So that's it for today, isn't it? And we've got this... And it's John tomorrow. Good.